Hello, heretics. This is Lilith. I'm very happy to be collaborating today with Secular TJ on a list of another 10 Bible contradictions. Let's begin. As you've no doubt noticed if you've ever spoken to a Christian believer anywhere, the Bible is their authority for everything. How you should live your life, what you should do, what you should value, and the stories of the Bible inform all of these opinions. So that begs a few very important questions. How should a believer treat non-believers? I guess it depends who you ask. According to Deuteronomy 13, 6-7, non-believers should be killed. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him. Neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. However, if that isn't quite your speed, you can always look at 2 Corinthians six fourteen to 17 where it says that the believers should shun unbelievers. After all, they wouldn't want to be corrupted by our darkness and evil. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. But then, if you look at Leviticus 19.18 and Matthew 5.44 or 7.12, the commandment appears to be that the believers should be kind and loving to the non-believers. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Since you'll be told by pastors and apologists that there are really no contradictions in the Bible, one does have to wonder how exactly you would reconcile these. Should they shun us kindly? Should they kill us with love? Do you do these things sequentially or simultaneously? And how does that work exactly? These are the troubles that those who believe in the inerrant authority of the Bible have to contend with makes me glad I'm not one of them. But let's look at our second contradiction. The believer's relationship with God is the most important in their life, so it would be very important to be clear about that relationship. Should we fear God? Well, according to Leviticus 25.17 and Deuteronomy 4.10, among others, yes, we should fear God. And indeed, it's often quoted that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. 
especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. But then, if we were to look at 1 John 4.18, we would have to conclude, no, we should not fear God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. After all, if God is love, and love casts out fear, how could we possibly fear him if he loves us, or if we love him? Perhaps the believer is meant to do both at the same time, sort of a Schrodinger's cat of fear and not fear. I guess as long as you don't open Pandora's box, both are true, and you're fine. Better not get curious. But then, so many things come down to the authority of God, as it's claimed by Christians. But then, according to the Bible, who is the ruler of this world? Well, according to Joshua 3.13 and 2 Kings 19.15, God is the ruler of this world. And indeed, that would make sense if he were indeed the creator and sustainer that Christians tell us he is. But there's a problem. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. You see, according to John sixteen seven to 11 and 2 Corinthians 4, 2 to 4, Satan is the ruler of this world. So how did that happen? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Does Satan get us every other weekend? I really hope he called summer and spring break. It seems like those would be good times for Satan to be ruling the world. But maybe I'm just thinking of partying. Who exactly negotiated this custody agreement? Is there some sort of heavenly law office that notarizes these things? Can we appeal? Perhaps prefer one over the other? Who knows, but it will be fun to find out. The fourth question, and one that is very important if you listen to apologists, is to ask how are people judged by God? After all, we are told that God will judge us all, and we have to be in the right place for that. If you've ever heard a street preacher, they are always preaching judgment after death. But what are the criteria? It seems a rather important question. 
Well, according to Matthew 12, 35 to 37, Luke 10, 25 to 28, and John 5, 28 and 29, God judges us through our words and deeds. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. This makes sense, more or less. It seems a reasonable criteria. But then, if you read Mark 16:16, 16, 16, John 3:17 to 18, and John 3:36, you find that God judges the living and the dead, presumably, by their faith in Jesus. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So that leads to all kinds of interesting queries. Jeffrey Dahmer is purported to have converted and said the sinner's prayer before his death? Does he go to heaven? What if one of his victims was an atheist and presumably past the age of reason? Did they go to hell? What about charitable Hindus, Muslims, Baha'i, Jews? What about Preachers who turn out to be crooked. Well, who knows? Maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's kind of a shoot. Craps shoot. You bet on red or black and see which one comes up. I hope it's at least that interesting. It would be pretty dull if it was just a flip of the coin. Of course, the tragic story of the death and resurrection of Jesus is fundamental to the Christian faith, as well as his heartbreaking betrayal by Judas, one of his trustworthy friends. But things are a bit foggy on the details of what happened to Judas after the crucifixion. We do know he died. But how? According to Matthew 27, 1-5, Judas hanged himself after he threw down the money in the temple. And the priests took the money and bought the potter's field. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. 
And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. If you were a skeptic, that could be said to contradict with Acts 1, 15 to 18. In that story, Judas kept the money and bought the potter's field himself. And then he was struck by God, fell headlong, and his guts spilled everywhere. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about an hundred and twenty, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Pleasant an image as that is, some... Apologists have insisted that he hung himself in the field, and then his guts spilt open. I'm not precisely certain, though, how one is supposed to fall headlong if your head is tied to a tree. That's some next-level yoga. I've never seen that. Maybe it's really dangerous, and that's why they don't teach it anymore. Who knows? Food for thought. So there you have it. Five topics from the Bible that are totally not contradictions. Not a bit. I don't know where you got that idea. My thanks again to Secular TJ for his generous offer to come on his channel. And I look forward to seeing the next in his series of Bible Contradictions. Take care.